actually we uh, I just want you to pick up a few things before we get started here about Nehemiah there in chapter 4 we talked about he was dealing with all kinds of opposition and uh, the big thing I didn't really finish up this morning was it, but one thing I want you to keep in mind no matter what it is in life you're doing the devil's going to oppose you if you ain't got nobody else opposing you the devil will and you've got to make up your mind like and if you'll notice something as you read through the book of Nehemiah that every time he was hit with it, he prayed. He would pray, but then there's something else. He just kept moving. The Bible said, be steadfast, therefore, my brother, un, you know, uh, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor of the Lord is not in vain. Be steadfast, keep moving. The things you learn off of Nehemiah was when he faced opposition and discouragement and all this kind of stuff, he prayed. He took it to the Lord. And, uh, and then he didn't let it deter him. He didn't let it get him off the trail. He just prayed, went on. And he didn't let people distract him and stuff. He had a, he had a calling of his life, uh, calling from God on his life. And he just set his face like a flint. And he said, I'm going to do this. And whether everybody's with me or not, I'm doing it. And that's the thing you've got to do. You, and there's many areas of your life where you need to, just get, you need to get bullheaded about. This, this is right. This is what God's told me to do, and I'm doing it, and I'm sticking with it, and I'm not letting all the opposition stuff deter my way. So you can learn a lot off this man. I pray that you'll get acquainted with this man in your own Bible reading. But uh, after chapter 4, where he deals with this ridicule and this mocking, he deals with the discouragement from his own people, from Judah there in verse number 10, uh, the discouragement stuff that they were doing, the weariness. And then it tells you about how he set the families up and how they armed themselves so they could continue the work. And he got down in verse number 23. So neither I nor my brother nor my servants nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes, saving that every one of them put off or put off them for washing. He said, Reggie, what do you get out of that? What I get out of that, he wasn't sitting over at the palace with a fan on him. He was out there working with them. This man, Nehemiah, is a great example of leadership, whether it be in our homes, families, work, faith, it doesn't make any difference. Government, there's a great thing here. This guy didn't ask other people to do things he was not willing to do himself. And uh, we're going to get into chapter 5, and, and we're going to see what made this man, Nehemiah, that God said, I'm going to put him in the Bible. I'm putting a story in the Bible. There was a great cry, verse number 1, of the people and their wives against, the brethren, against their brethren, the Jews. For there, went, for there were that said, we, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Some also that were there said, we have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, and houses that we might buy corn because of the dearth. I would encourage you to underline the word mortgaged and underline the word dearth. Verse number four, there were also that said, we have borrowed money. I'd underline that for the king's tribute and that upon our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is of the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. And some of our daughters are brought unto bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them for other men have our lands and vineyards. Now we're going to stop right there for just a minute. Uh, this is a problem that it comes up in the building of the walls is a very practical problem, very real problem. I want you to take your Bibles now with me to Exodus chapter 22, and we're going to look at the foundation of this problem and how Nehemiah dealt with it. Now, let me just say this to you in, in, while you're turning there, what we can learn from Nehemiah. When he was hit with a problem, he responded with a biblical response. Here's how his mind worked. Here comes a problem. And this was a big problem. This, it says in that passage of scripture that there was a great cry of the people. Now, when the Bible says there was a great cry, there was a great cry. And it says, and of the wives against their brethren, the Jews. So you've got brethren and the Jews. You've got problems between uh, pe the, the Jewish people here. And a great cry. It's trouble. So what does Nehemiah do? Does he run in there and say, all right, now listen, y'all supposed to love each other. Oh, you all just get along good here. You shouldn't act like that toward each other. He went to the Bible. Now, this is a big deal right here. This is why this man is a great man. He didn't just arbitrarily say, well, I'm going to try to do the fair thing here. He went back to the word of God. And I will show you there's at least three to four passages of scripture in the law where he's going to go back to. And so he has the authority of God's word to do and make the decisions that he makes. And now my prayer is this, that I will, and I hope you will, when we're hit with problems, start thinking, what does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible say? Go back and make sure that we're, we're right, that we're, we got it understood rightly and as it is, and then go with it. 
And so, uh, anyway, let's look at Exodus chapter 22, and we're going to look at verse number 25, verse, chapter 22 and verse 25. Now, this is just statutes and judgments of the Lord that God gives. And by the way, this is how we are to live. I don't care what area of life, God will address it. But he's addressing something right here. In fact, if you get up to verse number 22 in, in chapter 20, verse 22 of chapter 22, this is what he says. You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any wise and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. And my wrath will wax hot, shall wax hot and I will kill you with the sword and your wives will be widows and your children fatherless. Now God's laying, laying it out strong there. He said, don't you ever take advantage of a widow. Don't you ever take advantage of the fatherless. You be kind and you be gracious and consider those people. Now, by the way, this ought to just be cornbread and beans Christianity. Amen. But the truth about it is we're not careful, you know, we're going to get drifted away. Then in verse 25 is where he hammers down. And this is where this is where Nehemiah is going to go to for wisdom of handling this internal problem that he had with people. If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shall not be to him as an usurer. Neither shall thou lay upon him usury. Now, usury is what we would often term as interest. Okay. So God is saying, here's a statute. This is a law. This is a judgment. This is how God says to live. He said, if you have poor people and they're having a hard time and you decide that they need money and you decide to loan to them, you do not loan to them and charge them interest. You don't do that. Now, he said, if it's a stranger, and this is another pastor of scripture, a stranger, he said, you can charge interest. He said, no, you don't do that among your brethren. Now, if you'll remember in this passage of scripture, they were charging, uh, they were charging usury. They were, they were, they were uh, making it hard on these people. Now, I want you to go now to uh, uh, Leviticus chapter 25. Go to Leviticus chapter 25 and we'll look further. Now, again, the main thing I want to get out of this is learn how this leader, how this man of God dealt with situations with problems and people in internal problems with people. Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 35. Bible says, verse number 35 of Levit Leviticus 25, And if thy brother be waxen poor, and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him. Yea, though he be a stranger, or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. Take thou no usury of him, or increase. But fear thy God, that thy brother may live with, th with thee. Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan. And he goes on about bond service and hired servants and so forth and all about that. But again, he tells them there, he said, listen, you don't uh, uh, charge usury and you don't make it hard. And, and by the way, it's, it goes farther than usury. You don't take advantage. You don't make it hard on. You don't get take advantage of his bad situation. Okay. Now, if you will, go to uh, Leviticus. Let's back up there that same chapter to verse uh, 17 in chapter 25 of Leviticus, chapter 17. The same chapter, just the 17th verse. You shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy, thy God, for I am the Lord your God. Now, I want you to keep in mind, he said, number one, don't you oppress people. Don't oppress people. Number two, he said, fear the Lord. He said, fearing the Lord is a, is a guard against being oppressive to people. Because God is watching and you take advantage of weak people or people that's going through a hard time or widows or orphanages, whatever it may be. God says, you remember I'm watching and you're going to get hold accountable to that. And so he's saying the fear of the Lord, because literally Nehemiah is going to say in prayer, Lord, I feared thee. I feared you. He's going to literally quote from that. He is, he is practicing his faith. He says, I fear the Lord. This is wrong. We can't do that. God has already talked about. Now go finally, if you will, to Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy chapter 23. Uh, and I'm doing this to show you that this is not just one little arbitrary deal uh, going on. By the way, if we were to get into it tonight, this has tremendous applications to our nation today and has had in the past. And I will talk a little bit about the history of even our forefathers that, that we're sitting here tonight of our, of our fathers back in the thirties and in the fifties. And there's, uh, it's kind of wild to me how, and I'm not even going to go there, but, uh, how things come around Deuteronomy chapter, uh, 23 and verse number 19, the Bible said, thou shalt not lend upon, upon usury to thy brother, usury of money, usury of victuals, 
usury of anything that is lent upon usury. Unto the stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand to do in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Now, what you have back over here in Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 5 is you have brethren. These are all Jewish people. Uh, they're in the land there. And he's trying to get the wall built. He's trying to get a work of God done. And they're having some practical problems. And part of it is it's just eating and making it day by day. They're having a tough time financially. Anybody besides me ever had, I, you know, tough time? Anybody go through tough times financially? And by the way, most of us are going to take our turn one, somewhere along the trail of life. And it won't hurt you. It's good for you. It has a lot of blessings to it. In fact, it makes you be appreciative of other people, understand other people when they're down. It, you're not quite as critical. And you also understand that everything's not always just like you may see it. Uh, there may be been things that happened that you don't know about that caused that, okay? And uh, <laughs> I'm thinking about that little joke. I'm thinking about that joke when that little boy, he went out like that. He hollered at the crowd, brethren, pray for me. <laughs> the little child, the little boy leaned across his dad. He says, folks, pray for me. <laughs> okay. So let's look at it again. And just again tonight, this is just a pastoral message. You go back up in verse number three and it says, now watch this. We have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy corn because of the dearth. I won't condemn them so mad. It's, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's so bad that they had their mortgage. I'm going to be honest with you. It's pretty hard to buy a home without having a mortgage on it. I mean, who, who's, unless you're born with a bunch of money. Now, there's ways you can save when you're little. And I applaud all that. I, I, think, I, I, believe you, I believe, actually believe you have faith. And you get in the Word of God and do things I believe is possible. Build a house debt-free and all that. But truth about it is most people, it's not happening for them. Okay? So I'm not going to condemn these people a lot for having a mortgage on their place, but, but there's something I want you to remember here. Watch this very, very carefully. We have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, and that we might do something. Now watch this. Don't ever do this. Don't ever mortgage your place to buy groceries. Now there was a problem. Why were these people out of the land to start with? Why was Nehemiah in captivity to start with? Look at it. There's a dearth. God had said, now watch this, back over in Deuteronomy and in the Old Testament, he said, if you disobey my commandments and my judgment, my statutes, he said, I not only will have you taken captive, but he said, I will send a famine in the land. So here's a problem. They're not getting any rain. There's not, uh, they're, they're, they've got a famine going on. There's a dearth in the land and things are not growing. I'm going to tell you right now, this country is not near as big in style as it thinks it is. If God should decide this summer to shut the water off, so if there's no corn grown in Illinois, I don't care how black the dirt is in Illinois. If God don't send the rain, there's no corn. I don't care what you got. And you say, well, I, pump out the, I'll, I can pump out of the well and I can irrigate my garden. I'm all glad for you and I hope you can. But I'm telling you right now, if God shuts the water off to this country, there'll be no hay to feed the cattle. There'll be no grain to feed the cattle. So that means there's no meat on the shelf. And I'm telling you, the ramifications of it are serious and they're powerful. And we ought to always think about these things. God wants us to be prudent. God wants us to be thoughtful about these things. We're living in a nation, if we're not careful, I'm telling you so, folks, we're living in a nation that's like the judgment of God is just like, it's like God doesn't want to, but God's saying, you keep this up, I'm going to nail you. And that's just the way it is. But these people had mortgaged their lands, their vineyards, their houses to buy corn because of dirt. Now watch this. This is where it's really. So number one, they're, they're, they've made a liens against their property just to buy groceries with because they're not growing anything. There's no food out there. Somewhere or another, they're getting their, their corn and stuff in. Then verse number four, there were also that said, we have, watch this, borrowed money for the king's tribute. Taxes. Now I'll tell you when things is getting rough. When you mortgage your house to buy groceries... And then you're borrowing money to pay taxes, you're in trouble. And I'm going to tell you a little secret. And I don't care how spiritual you are, that's going to bug you. You're going to have a hard time walking into church worshiping God and saying glory to God in the highest. Everything's wonderful. And isn't God good? Because you're going to sit there in church and you're going to be thinking about, I can't even buy groceries. I, I've got taxes to pay and, and I'm going to, I need to go borrow money to pay my stinking taxes. These people were, I mean, this stuff had really come in on top of them here. And it was, a, it was a big, big, this is why they were crying. This is why they were saying, somebody help us. We got troubles here. And so now watch what happens. It's even worse than this. And by the way, your Christian forefathers that come into this land, did you ever notice something? You can't be sent to debt because of not, sent to jail for not paying your debts in America. Now you can be sent to jail for cheating people out of when you didn't pay your debt. But if you can't pay your debt, they can't send you to jail in America. There's a reason for that. That's not going to do you any good. 
We're going to talk about some things here tonight. Because in England, you could be put in jail. How are you going to pay your debt off in jail? You, you, know, you owe $500 some old boy, you go to jail. I mean, how are you going to work in there and pay your debt off? They used to have what's called debtor's prisons. And this whole thing is, and, and God wants justice. And I hope I can do this thing justice tonight. Verse number five. Now watch verse five. Now yet our flesh is the flesh of our brethren. You know what they're saying? Hey, we are Jews too. We are brethren in a faith. We're not strangers. We're not somebody, you know, out of, they said we're, we're brethren. Our children is their children. Okay. And lo, we bring into, watch this bondage, our sons and our daughters to be servants. Why were they doing that? Can you imagine this here? Okay, you're, you know, just being handy here, Brother Phil and Sister Dana, they got these kids here. And uh, so they got, ta- they got taxes they can't pay. They, they, they can't buy groceries. And, uh, and so now they're saying, hey, we're going to put our kids out to servants uh, to, 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 to pay these bills or to pay those that's charging us usury. And I'm telling you something, folks, in a bad situation, bad situation. And it gets worse. We've uh, put our sons and daughters to be servants, and some of our daughters are brought into bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. I mean, and I'm just going to tell you what's going on here, and you read it, meditate on it. I've done a little bit of historical stu- study on this thing, but you literally had a greedy pack of people who just absolutely didn't care about what anybody else was going through, and they took advantage of people that were down and having a hard time and a tough time. And I'm going to tell you, now you listen to me tonight, we're... I would say that most people in this church house would consider yourself to be a conservative, you know, in some sense of the word in the political spectrum. OK, and the word where did the liberals get their name liberal? Why did they come up with the name liberal for themselves? By the way, you know, the Bible talks about falsely uh, calling yourself a liberal when you're not a liberal. It does. It talks about there'll be a day when that's God's not going to put up that anymore. Going identifying yourself with a false tag. That sounds good. But then where did they get the idea of liberal now? What's going, okay, so if you go back in the history of America, you come up through the uh, industrial age, lots of jobs, machineries being developed, all that kind of thing. And the railroad was going through the country and there was land available and the government was given 160 acre tracts. If you'd go and live on it two years, homestead acts and so forth, you could live on that and, uh, and so forth. And there was a lot of opportunity and there was a growth, all that kind of thing. We come up into the early 1900s and, um, and we have what the capitalistic free enterprise system, okay? Then we get into the Roaring Twenties. In the Roaring Twenties, you get into a deal where you've got your stock markets and people, for the first time in history, people out in the, because of the, uh, what, Telegraph, people out in these little towns and stuff could purchase stocks and they could trade stocks. I don't know if you've ever done your study or watched the documentaries on this, but people would buy stock and so forth. And uh, all of a sudden, you, you could trade stock up in, on this New York Stock Exchange and live at Norwood, Missouri. And what was happening was, it was called the shark and the minnows. I mean, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Sharks and minnows. Sharks and minnows is whenever they set up a deal and boys making money, making money. And they do that to make you put your money into it. If you put your money into it, you'll make money like we make. Then they get it to a certain height. And then the, that's the minnow. They're pulling the minnows into the pool. Then they get it to a certain height. And then the sharks come in and they eat up the, the minnows. And they eat up the money. In other words, you put all this money in there and it was making money like, wow, all these guys are making money. And all of a sudden you put your money in it. And the trap shuts and you don't get your money back. You've lost everything you put in there and the sharks pull it back out. Then they go start another company and they do it all over again. And this is done today. This is done right now. I mean, this is part of the thing. That's why I'm me. I, I, I ain't got any money, but if I had any money, it wouldn't be as New York Stock Exchange. I'm not playing with those sharks. I'm a minnow. I'm not, I'm not a shark. They'd eat me alive. If I'm going to lose it, I'm going to, I'm going to be like dad said. I'll, if I had a million dollars, I'd farm it. It's all gone. <laughs> Because that's just how it is, okay? I don't need, you know, dad used to say, why should I go to Vegas? I'm farming already. I'm gambling, you know, I'm, ris- I'm risking everything, you know. But here's what I'm saying. You don't mess with these people. These are people who, you, you're, you're nobody. You're nothing. You're nothing. And they see these people, they, you know what? They know something. They know people want to make money easy without labor. They know that, that people have a secret desire to get rich and to make money without doing anything really to do it. So they play upon that secret desire, set up these situations, and they make them make money, and they feed them. See, what they do is they feed them, and the value of the stock goes up, and you're thinking, man, but I, I should have got in yesterday. And this is where it was back in the late 20s. And so you have, now watch this, right here, right here in this county, right here in this part of the state, Arkansas, Oklahoma. People were put, sending money up and, that, and the sharks came in and got them. 
And then when that thing, went, and by the way, you can't do that forever because the, it collapses eventually. All the, play, all the play money, all the printed money. And so what happened was when that fell, these people, lost. now if you, how many, how many in here has abstracts? Brother uh, Lakey, I know you're old enough to have abstracts, right? Used to, if you traded, if you bought and sold a piece of land, you got an abstract. Nowadays it's title insurance, but the abstract was a history of your property. And you could go way back in there and find that, okay? You could find out who owned it and so forth. How many knows what you'll find in old abstracts out of the Midwest, all over the Midwest? If you go back to the 30s, what you're going to find out is that many people mortgage their property to buy stock or they mortgage their property to buy uh, uh, the fruit trees, Stark Brothers fruit trees or tomato plants. You say, you've got to be kidding me. Nope. There are people who put second mortgages on their farms. They, got, they maybe almost had their farm paid off and they went in and borrowed the money to plant. I literally have read where, where Starks Brothers re, re, uh, cl- for, done the foreclosure on farms around here because they could, people couldn't pay the, the, the note. The, they financed the fruit trees to you. Okay, let's say you bought $1,000 worth of fruit trees back in the 30s. That's a lot of trees. And you, and you got the catalog and they said, you plant these trees, man, these things will grow. There'll be no worms, no, no nothing. I mean, it always rains and there's always going to be fruit. And everybody wants it and you can sell it. Let me just tell you something. How many's tried to raise fruit trees here in this country? All right. First of all, you've got to dig like a dog to get down through the rock to plant the stupid things. And then if you're not careful, they're going to die. And if you don't prune them and you don't know what you're doing, then here comes the insects. And then here comes no rain. And it goes on and on. And these people literally, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, thousands, not hundreds, thousands of farms were lost in the 30s and 20s because of the, just these issues where they went in and mortgaged their farms. Right here in your Bible. Trying to get ahead, maybe, or so a situation like that, and the and the trap closed in on them. It, it, I'm telling you. By the way, back then, fruit was a big deal. If you had fruit, it was worth something. But getting it was another thing. Between the between the the weather and the frost. Hey, what about man? You got these. Oh my good! Look look at the blossoms and boom! Frost hits. Late frost. You're out. Done. So this is the danger of mortgaging your property on stuff like that. The unknowns and the uncertains. If this will help you tonight. You know, just be careful is all I want to tell you. Okay, just be careful. It's not, you know, just be careful what you're doing. Um, but anyway, so we have a little bit of an idea about what was going on here. And there was just, by the way, how many has ever, and I do not recommend it. I have not read it. I know about it. I've, but uh, The Grapes of Wrath. How many has heard of The Grapes of Wrath book? Okay, so it's a filthy book. But the whole book is about what I'm talking about tonight. And, and this is where your liberals came from. In the late 20s, people lost all kinds of stuff. Dust Bowl, we had the drouse, the dearth in this passage of scripture. Farmers went broke everywhere. Uh, how many knows what a penny auction is? Does anybody in this place know what a penny auction? You know what a penny auction is? A penny auctions occurred back in the 30s, and here's what they were. The banks would foreclose on a piece of property. They had all the machinery and all the cattle and everything, they, so they set up an auction, okay? The neighbors would come in, and they all agreed, we only bid pennies. And, and, buy, and I want to tell you something further. I'll get tough with you. If you came in and started buying stuff, there'd be about six, seven guys drag you out behind the trucks and beat the snot out of you and run you off. Penny auctions were where they came in and all the neighbors, auctioneer, want, you know, say a cow was worth $15. They'd say penny. And nobody was supposed to be in the neighborhood. Sell the cow for a penny. Now I'm talking about rough days, but people were losing everything they had. And neighbors banded together and said, nobody will bid at this auction. Nobody will buy anything at this auction except we're going to buy it. And then we're going to turn around and give it back to those people. Things got really, really, really rough. And so you had penny auctions. Actually, to be truthful, sometimes at the height of that thing, it was a dangerous occupation to be an auctioneer. If you came in, to, and, if you came in and you tried to get, you started to get a little bit tough about that, it'd haul you off. It's rough, rough living. People were, I'm telling you, people, it, it was tough. And you say, well, I can't imagine anything. No, you can't because you've never been there. Let me tell you, in my little short life, I have sold people out that are 70 years old. I've sat at their kitchen tables, 70, 72, 73 years old, and not just once or twice. And look me in the eye and say, Reggie, we were, we've had this farm for 40 some years and we're losing it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you tonight, and we're talking about finances here. I'm your pastor. We're looking at the Bible. Let me tell you something. I saw more farms lost. Because a man and his wife, they worked hard, paid the farm off, everything's going good. And one of the children decided they wanted to go in farming with them. That's wonderful. Great. If you do it right. The boy comes in, he says, or the 
girl and her husband, whatever it is, and they come in and say, oh, dad, we need a new tractor. And he's used an old tractor all his life. Dad, we need a new barn. So old dad goes in and he finances the farm that they had paid off to buy the new tractors, to build the new barn, to do all the big, big, big deals that, have, you know, that they think they need. And then two years later, things are getting rough and nobody's making any money. And the boy decides he's going to Kansas City to work. He leaves, leaves a 70-year-old dad there with all the debts. And he can't do it. You say, that's true. I have seen it. I have dealt with, I have worked with people that that, that that happened to. Be careful what you're doing. Don't get quiet on me. Don't, go, don't shut me off, okay? I'm just telling you, think about what you're doing. Think about all this stuff when you're going in. It's, it's a wonderful thing, but you want to be careful. Uh, a lot of the lands in this country was lost by foreclosure. Um, you'll see Stark Brothers on a lot of, of, uh, of your uh, abstracts. And uh, what you had, what's called the Great Migration. There was two of them out of this part of the country. One of them was, they were all to California. One was in the 30s and the other was in the 50s. And both times there were great droughts, just like in right here. And, and people, nothing wouldn't grow. Uh, literally, if you talk to the old men in this country, Brother Lecky, and I'm not saying you're an old man, but you're not a young guy either. Do you know of anybody that cut tree limbs or trees down for, and the cows follow them through the woods eating? Do you know of that? He's shaking his head yes. Now, let me tell you how tough it got during the 30s and the 50s when the dry weather hit. Men would go through with their chopping axes, cutting down small trees through the woods, maybe, maybe like this or whatever, big as they thought they could get down. Trees fought the cows following them, eating the leaves off the tree because there was no grass to eat. And they're trying to, trying to make it through to the other side of this. This is why you want to keep yourself, your, if you owe money, you want to keep yourself in very good leverage position that you're not, you're not caught. Because I promise you, God could shut you, God can, and, and, and if you think, well, I'm not going to do it because of him, I wouldn't bet on that. Okay? Uh, trying to get through this thing here. Um, verse number four again, down at the bottom part. Neither is in our power to redeem it, for other men have our lands and our vineyards. Now, so what had happened? They had, the, it was dry, they couldn't grow their crops. They couldn't pay their bills. So then they begin to borrow on their land for basic necessities of life. Then they, then they put their kids out for hire to try to pay. They repos so they mortgaged the property, couldn't make the payments on the property. So now they've lost their property. And these people are literally destitute. Now, going back to the liberal issue, when you come up through the 20s and the 30s there, 1932, 1928, uh, uh, Hoover was elected president. We were operating, and the whole American deal was, was operating on uh, free enterprise capitalism. But let me tell you about free enterprise capitalism. It is a wonderful thing, but it can be abused. And that's, what, that's why, can I tell you something? It was abused. There was no controls on Wall Street. Nobody was watching the chicken house. And what happened was, see, I don't know if you know your history or not, but since World War II, Abraham Lincoln was the first the Whig Party died out and the Republican Party was birthed right there at 18, late 1850s. Abraham Lincoln was the first Republican president. He was elected upon the basis of uh, slavery and, 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 and free enterprise and all, all these kind of things. And the Republicans, because of the Civil War, were in power, basically in power. And there's a few exceptions, but they were basically in power from the end of the Civil War, beginning of the Civil War, until 1932 when FDR was elected. And here's literally what happened. This is why, I'm going to tell you something. This is why you don't want to never, never, never be allegiant to a party or a political movement at the expense of biblical truth. Because all parties can violate the Bible. And power corrupts and absolute power absolutely corrupts. There needs to be checks and balances. That's why our founders set that forth. Our founders knew the depravity of man and that given unchecked power, he would abuse people. And so you had a, what people begin. And so when people get des, de, desperate and all these people lost all these farms and lost businesses and right here in Norwood, let me tell you something right here in Norwood, a banker jumped down a well in the thirties in Ava, a banker jumped down the well in the thirties, committed suicide. And I don't know all the details about it, but I will tell you, uh, why a lot of bankers because they felt uh, they felt some of it was just they felt so bad who wants to go out and repossess everybody's house repossess everybody's farm 
who wants to go out and, and, and do this to people and see these little kids ragged and, and poor and stuff? And, did, and they just, it overwhelmed them. Some of it was because they had been playing with people's money and they could not pay, repay it back. They were playing the stock market with the deposits of people. This is why you have a FDIC today. Back then you didn't have that. So now get me. Because we did not rule ourselves according to biblical principles, then God did exactly what he said about because of the transgressions of the land, many are the princes thereof. So you had the FDR coming in with all the New Deal programs and all of a sudden government comes in and is going to control everything from what you get for your government come in and, and, and bought everybody's cows, paid for it. I mean, knows about all the milk that was dumped, all the apples that were, I mean, the food that was dumped. Government comes in and this all of a sudden they're going to be the price setter for everything. You have this mass government takeover. But to do all this stuff, the government done. Guess what the government had to do? Had to do what they did here. Tribute. Taxes. And that's why your taxes are like they are now. And so these people learn, these bureaucrats learn that if they can, they have the power to tax. They have the power to control people and control price and everything. Now, I'm just going to give you a good example. Brother Ed Waltis, you're sitting back here tonight. And Ed uh, and many uh, used to, I had several people here milk cows. But Ed, I'll tell you what, uh, the government got in the parity business. And this is what par parity means this, that the government's going to guarantee a floor price. And I've probably said this before, but this has happened in hogs. By the way, how many knows right now that the men who paid, paid ten and $15,000 an acre for Iowa cornland are in trouble right now if they, don't, if they didn't have it? It didn't have the cash to do it. You know why? Because the government did a deal called ethanol and they required going to go so, so much ethanol be put in. Where was that ethanol coming from? It was coming from corn. And you know what it made corn do? It made corn shoot straight up and people were getting rich off of corn. And so it's planting everything in corn. It made the price of land go up. People started trying to fight him over the land. In Iowa, I know this for a fact. Back at that time, they would not list their property. They would put it up to auction because nobody had any idea what it really might bring. They were afraid to price it. It was getting so high. So then what happened? Government comes in. Uh, we're done with the ethanol program. All of a sudden, now you've got all this high-priced land that you thought the government was going to prop up the prices for you. You're shot. You're gone. You're hurt. That's why you don't want to trust government. But let me give you an illustration about I was talking about Ed. Back in the 70s and 80s, this milk parity thing come on. And Randy, you know about this. And the government come in and put parity under it. All right. Now, the one I remember is the $9 parity. We're going to guarantee anybody will get $9 for your milk. So you got government pyramid. So you know what that's? Okay, well I can go buy a farm, I can buy a tractor, I can buy this, I can buy that, buy his cows, and I'll have. I know it's milk's not going to go less than this. There was just one big problem with that. They, see, they had it. The parity is always set. We can just kind of barely make it. It's kind of like a last floor. You're not going to really make any money, but you might not go broke. Okay. Well, here's what happened out west, <clears throat> out in the sand. The big boys said, "Oh my goodness, this is neat. Government parity." We'll milk 10,000 cows. We don't have to make a lot per cow because we'll bring in the illegal. Watch, listen to me, the illegals. And I know what I'm talking about. I have seen it, been there. That have 20 illegal Mexicans milking their cows, milking two, three, four, five, ten thousand 10,000 cows, making that much per cow, but making a lot of it because they multiply it times 1,000. Now you say, Reggie, you against free enterprise? No, but I'm going to tell you where I'm against. Inequality in the treatment. Here's where it was at. Ed and Terry and Randy... And his wife cannot compete against somebody who's using cheap 20, who's hiring 20 illegal aliens to milk their cows. The family farm could not keep up with that. They couldn't compete. And so they're having to, they're getting the same amount for their milk as these guys are out there, but they're milking 60 cows or 40 cows compared to 2,000 or 3,000 cows. And you know how it got there? Because the government got their self messed in with their stuff. And it's, it's, it's just like right here. And so people borrowed and got themselves in debt. And trying to fight it. And you just talk all over this county. There's empty dairy barns because of this. This is not a joke. And here's what I'm saying tonight. I'm your pastor. I love you. Might not help me. Or might help me. I might go broke next week. But you know something? You know, it makes us be really, really careful what you do. Know that you cannot trust. You don't know what the weather is going to do next year. We don't, we don't know that we're going to get a lot of rain. Now, we, God's been good to us and all that. We, we know, it, you know it's, it's going to rain some and all that. We don't know what the government's going to do. Right now, there's a lot of scared companies because of the tariff wars that may possibly come. You know, I, I mean, let's just what government does. You don't have control of. And when and these people here were being oppressed by their leaders. These were leaders that were pressing these people. We got to jump and go. I want to run this thing on. So here's what here's what Nehemiah does in verse six. He realizes that these people are are violating the word of God by charging this usury and oppressing these poor people. Okay. 
according to the Bible, this is wrong. He, this was, he didn't just run in and say, now listen, you're not being fair. Mm -mm. He said, you're violating scripture. So he's in. Now, by the way, keep in mind, he had been appointed governor by the king. All right. Over in Babylon. He'd been appointed governor. So he had the authority. Verse number six. And I was very angry. Now, I know that doesn't fit everybody's biblical, but Nehemiah is not your average cat. He is not your average cat. And we do need, some, we're at a point in America, we need some Nehemiahs. He was very angry when I heard their cry and these words. He cared about these people that were not getting fed. He cared about those kids that went to bed hungry at night. He cared about these people that lost their farms. He cared about these people who lost their vineyards. And he knew they wouldn't be going to be without. Let me tell you, these people ain't interested in building a wall if you don't know where you're going to get your next meal from. By the way, this, I'll just throw out this out. This is why you want to watch out for socialism. Do you know tonight down in Venezuela, which used to be the socialist utopia place, they're digging through trash piles down there tonight and people are literally almost killing each other for something to eat down there. It's that bad. He said, I was angry when I heard their cry. And here's what he did. And I love this. Look at verse seven. Underline this. How many members, brother uh, Larry Brown, preaching a message, uh, have a talk with yourself. Talk to yourself. Where do you get that? Got it out of the Bible. I, con <laughs> I love this. I consulted with myself. <laughs> How many ever consulted with yourself? <laughs> it won't hurt to sit down and think this thing through. You know, you know how he was consulting? He said, this is not a prideful statement. He was consulting what he knew to be truth. He said, God's word doesn't say that. God says, that's wrong. And he consulted with himself based upon the truth that he knew in scripture. And I rebuked the nobles. You know what he did? He didn't go around just trying to appease them, trying to, you know, oh, I can't offend the big boys. Remember those nobles? They would not put their neck to the work. Okay. Why didn't they have to go to work? You know why? Because they had already stripped the, the wealth out of these poor people. And they were not doing right. They were not being kind and considerate of other people. He said, I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said unto them, ye exact usury. By the way, we're looking at two things here. We're looking at usury and we're looking at taxes. Now, how many members this, in the late 70s, and I don't know exact dates on this, but some of you old enough to remember the 16, 18% interest rates. Anybody remember those? That broke a lot of dairy farmers. That broke a lot of farmers. You cannot pay 16 and 18% interest, folks. I'm sorry. By the way, well, let's get on here. He said, the exact usury, every one of his, bro of his brother. And I said a great assembly against them. He just pulled everybody in the town and said, all you folks are starving to death. All you folks had your land taken away from you. Come on up here to this meeting. Verse eight. And I said unto them, we, after our ability, have redeemed our brethren, the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. And will ye even sell your brethren or shall they be sold unto us? Then held they their peace and found nothing to answer. Now, you know why they couldn't answer anything? Because they were violating the word of God and they knew this wrong. But so far they had gotten by with it. <clears throat> now, I'm going to throw something at you. This may tick some people off. I, I, I like the phrase, make America great again. I'm going to tell you why I like it. Because if we're great, if we're strong, if we're right where we ought to be and we're strong, we might be able to help other people more. Okay. It's not a pride statement for me. America is a great nation. I'm telling you, there ain't nothing like it in this world. And if you think there is, go, go take a hike to third world countries and see how blessed this country is. And it's because of our biblical foundation. Now, uh, we can't help other people if we're broke ourselves. We need to be stout ourselves. We need to be strong so that we can help the down and out, so that we can help those that are poor. But if we're not in good shape, we can't do that. He said in verse number nine, but, but I, I'm just saying this to you. Get away from this socialistic attitude. Because everywhere, it does not work. It does not work anywhere on the face of this globe. It doesn't work. He also, he said, it is not good that you do. Ought you not to walk? Here it is in the fear of the Lord. Now, wh why did he say that? He says, you, he, remember the fear of the Lord back there in this text that we looked in the passage before? Because the reproach of the heathen are enemies. He said, I likewise and my brethren and my servants might exact of them money and corn. He said, I could do this, but I'm not going to do it. Why? Because the Bible teaches for me not to do it. I pray you, let us leave off this usury. Now, the Bible said he's very angry. Now, I, I, can, I can appreciate this because you know what? It was hurting the work of the Lord. It was hurting the strength of, this, of these Jewish people. <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say what I was going to say about America being great. It bothers me. And I, let me show you where capitalism get off, get off the wheels and free enterprise. I'm, I'm for, if anybody go out here and start a business and do well, I'm all for them. I'm going to tell you what I don't like. You go into Walmart, and if you can find something in there to buy made in America, I'll take you out to supper. Maybe it's not made. I guess I don't go there. I shouldn't maybe say that. But everything I see in there is somewhere. China? Well, you say, what's your problem with that? I'll tell you what my problem with that is, is that weakens this country. 
So there is no telling. There is no way to count the jobs that we've lost because we want to buy a cheap product in China so we can sell it here. But this catch, it's, it's, it eventually will catch up with you. And I'm not against having stuff made in a foreign country as long as it's not doing basic damage and causing poverty to our own people. And it's weakening our economic strength in this country. I don't like it. And I'm going to tell you another reason I don't like it. And what, this is why I don't like government intrusion. The reason that so many country businesses have moved overseas or down to Mexico or up to Canada somewhere is because those countries do not have the bureaucratic oversight that we have. They don't have OSHA and every other guy sitting on top of their. I'm telling you, right in this church right here, I know of businesses inside this church where OSHA has literally caused the business to shut down because you can't. You, you, I mean, they'll fine you to death. And not only that, but then the tax rate. So here's Mexico saying, hey, bring your plant down here. We'll give you a piece of land. We will build the building. You just hire a thousand people. We'll set you up. You won't be taxed. You, there won't be people breathing down your neck. You go through about four or five deals. And that's one other thing we'll tell you. You come down here, ain't no lawyer going to sue you. You won't be drugging the court every, every little deal going on. So you got this business and you're barely making it up here and you've got 1,500 families and you're thinking of employing. You know what? You get to thinking, maybe we ought to just do that. I'm tired of fighting this. It's either, fight, it's either move or shut it down. This is the undercurrent that was going on during the, the Trump campaign. And I'm going to tell you why we don't connect it to it because we're not an industrial area. This is an agri area. We don't have big industry here. We don't really connect with those people like we maybe ought to. Because I'm going to tell you something, every piece of clothing you got on, every shoe you got on, somebody's making it somewhere. And it's affecting somebody's lives, whether they get to make it or the Mexicans get to make it. Okay. Again, I'm not against it in a totality. I just think that we need a level playing field here in this country and, and about that. <clears throat> okay. Verse, uh, uh, verse number 11. Restore, I pray to you, them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, their houses, also the hundredth part of the money. Now, I did a little research on this and what that sounds like on the surface is they're getting, they're paying 1% uh, interest, but everything I've read on it, not so it's a monthly 100th. It's 12%. They were doing a monthly, it, that 100th was a monthly deal. So your per annum charge is 12%. Can I tell you something? Any business that makes 12% is a whopping business. If your business makes 10% pure profit, you have got one business. Hang on to it tight. And if, if now I'm not going to say definitively that I'm right on that, but the research I've done, this hundredth was talking about, that was a monthly charge, 1% every month kind of makes sense because what, how do we make our, how, how do we pay our mortgages back? Mostly monthly payments. And they say this is actually 12% per annum, a one hundredth per, per, per month. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but I can tell you this, <clears throat> something was eating their money up. Something was eating their labor up. The man was mortgages. And then there was taxes on top of that. So he said, the hundredth part of the money, the corn, the wine, the oil, that ye exact of them. Then they said, we will restore them. Now, this is a good thing. These rulers and these nobles and so forth here, they said, you know what? We're going to do this. Now, they, but Nehemiah didn't just do this to walk in an arbitrary. He said, there is a biblical basis for this. By the way, you go back and study the Old, uh, the Old Testament back there. Every 50th year, they had a jubilee year. And, if you, and the land had to be restored to its owner. Let me tell you a little bit of something about tonight. <clears throat> I'm not against bankers and banking. In fact, I, I appreciate them. I think it's a wonderful thing to have a good banking system. Okay. Whether you believe this or not, there needs to be money available. It takes money to do things. You're going to start up a business and you're going to do something to design. Uh, uh, just, just, just make shirts. Just try that. Make anything. You're going to find out you need capital. You're going to need capital. Okay. You're going to start milking. You're going to need capital. You're going to start beef. You're going to need capital. All right. Uh, I'm not against banking, but banking carries with it. Lending people money carries with it responsibility. Number one, should you have made that loan to those people? Was it the right thing to do? Were they capable of repaying the loan? How many members? 2008, the housing collapse in 2008. Everything was going and all of a sudden, boom. By the way, people are just now a little bit starting to come out from underneath that somewhat. Okay. Housing, housing right now is booming. Okay. Now, in 2008, let me tell you what was going on. A queer, a sodomite by the name of Barney Franks and a man named Dodd. You ever heard of Dodd Frank? That's a bill. That's legislation was passed that under the liberal guys said everybody needs to own a home. That's a nice sounding thing, isn't it? OK, I know bankers personally who will tell you 
that the federales would come into their bank and say, you're going to make loans to everybody. And they were making, watch this, not 100% loans, not 80% loans, 103, 105% loans. How many knows what 103, 105% loan is? That means you're borrowing more than you need. And the banks and, and, and the federals, Dodd-Frank said this, you banks are going to do what we tell you to do or you're going to put, we're going to put you out of business. And here's what you're going to do. Anybody walks through that door, you're going to loan the money for a house. And you say, well, I don't think they can pay it back. They don't have a good job or they're, you know, they don't seem to be responsible. And I don't think that's a wise thing. It doesn't matter. You don't loan, make them the loan. We'll get you. And I've had bankers tell me, Reggie, we knew that 2008 was coming in the late nineties because we were making loans to people. We knew they'd never pay it back. Now watch this. You say, well, that doesn't affect me. Yes, it does. Because the honest man always pays the crooked man's bill. Always. And so it was wrong for them to say that everybody, so make the banks, but the banks didn't have any power. The federal government come in. Now, we're going to make you do it. You're going to be in a bank. we got banking regulators. You only get a banker excited, just what, let a regulator walk through the door. Because they got power over those people. And I know I'm getting, going, maybe you're saying, I'm not interested in all this stuff. Well, I want to tell you something. This is in the Bible. Amen. This is in the Bible. This is real life. It will affect you one way or another. And so I'm just saying this. Learn from this to be careful. Let's go on down. <clears throat> uh, it, 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 I, I appreciate what it is. So we will restore them, require nothing of them. So will we do as thou sayest. Then I called the priests and took an oath of them that they should do according to this promise. And I shook my lap and said, so God shake out every man from his house and his labor that performeth not his promise. Even thus shall he be shaken out and emptied. And all the congregation said, amen. And they did something. They praised the Lord. And they said, this greed and this oppression of the poor is going to stop. And I'm going to tell you right now. You're going to sit in the church here and you're going to meet with people. And there are people that can handle money and there are people that cannot handle money. And there's people who's tried to work their guts out and it didn't work for them. And it's not, and that's not a shame to go broke. Amen. If you tried and did the best you could and you went broke, there's no shame in that. And that's why America, we have bankruptcy law so you can get another start in life. It's not going to do any good to send you to prison. By the way, most people you know that have made it pretty good financially, they went broke three or four times before they got there. You just don't know their whole history. Sam Walton was getting ready to belly up. Before he went public with his stock and it shot him up, saved him. Read his story. And so it's not a shame to go broke. It's not a shame to be poor. In God's economy, he does not want poor people oppressed. So this is what I want to say in the church tonight. Don't you stick your finger at people and say, well, ring, 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 ring. Don't you be careful. Your time will come. And if you're in this church house and you've got a brother that has wax and poor and you find out you've got a little extra, it wouldn't hurt you to privately without being known who it is to help that brother. That's Bible. That's Bible. Help each other. And um, we need to ha have that. God wants us to have that. Wasn't you and I poor spiritually when Jesus died for us? Didn't we get his riches? Wasn't it our poverty of our, our spiritual poverty and his riches he gave to us? Amen. I was, I was spiritually bankrupt and Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. He reached down with his riches and gave me his righteousness. Brother, if that ain't, if that ain't helping the poor, I don't know what is. Well, verse number 14 says, moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, even from the 20th year into the two and 30th year of taxes, the king, that is 12 years, I and my brethren, watch this, now this is good. Now you're talking about example for leadership. I, I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the governor. Woo! Are you reading your Bible? I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the, bread of the governor. But the former governors that had been before me were chargeable in the people and had taken them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants bear rule over the people. And so did not I because of the fear of the Lord. Yea, I continued in the work of this wall, neither bought any land. And all my servants, he said, I didn't go in and take advantage of these people losing their land. And he said, I, he said, I didn't take the, the governor's bread. You know what he's telling you? He wasn't living off the taxpayers. Boy, I'm telling you, this is good stuff. If we could get rulers that would rule like Nehemiah ruled, you would not believe what happened in this land. Now, I know Trump's a whoremonger, worthless, no account thing. But he did give his salary the other day to some people. His presidential salary gave it away the other day. He said, well, he got plenty. I know, I know. Most rich guys want a little more. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, I have to give him credit for that, for that you know. And, um, but anyway, verse number... Uh, 17, moreover, there were at my table 150 of the Jews and rulers besides those that came to us among the heathen that are about us. And that was prepared for me daily was one ox and six choice sheep and fowls that prepared for me and once in 10 days, sorts of all kind, uh, store of all sorts of wine. Yet for all this, now watch, yet for all this required not I the bread of the governor because the bondage was heavy upon this people. 
And he said this in verse number 19, Think upon me, my God, for good according to all that's done for this people. <clears throat> I'll tell you what, uh, we need some public servants who aren't in it for what they can get. I don't know if you know about this or not. Hannah's not here tonight, but they're trying to get a bill passed this year where a legislator cannot go straight into lobbying. Let me tell you what happens a lot of, a lot of these deals. They get up there and they learn where all the money's at. I can tell you a story, make, make hair come off your head. But they learn where the money's at, and as quick as they know they're not going to be able, they decide not to run for office, they've already got themselves positioned, taking advantage of the connections and so forth. And I'm not against all that. The sense is, when, when you don't have the people's best mind, and you're, you're, you're trying to fatten your pocket up, when you don't care about what's really happening to your people out there, that's not right. And I like old Nehemiah. He said, I didn't eat the governor's bread. He said, I didn't try to eat, live off the taxpayer's back. He said, I try to live like they did. And I tried, he said, you know, we've got to try to make, it, get, make everybody get along here. And we have a, need to have a level playing field for people and, and op opportunity. And there is something about equal opportunity. We don't need to keep people down and keep them. I'm going to tell you something tonight. I'm not a big fan of this, this race deal. But I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care what color your skin is. If you're an American, you need the same right and opportunity that anybody else does. You do not need to be pushed down because of the color of your skin. That's right. Either that constitution says, and it's right, we're all created equal. And if somebody's getting pushed down because of the color of their skin, that ain't right. I wouldn't want it done to me for being white. <laughs> Amen. And so here's what I say to you tonight. Be careful with your finances as much as you can. And I'm going to say something. Like, if you go broke, you ain't the first one went broke. You're not the first one went busted. America's full of people went under. Full of people that got up and went again. That's the key. It's not whether you go broke, it's whether you get up and go again. Amen. Oh, my goodness. I like this kind of stuff. I really do. It's interesting to me. I, 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 li I like that book. And, and boy, if we had leaders like old Nehemiah and, and stuff. And, uh, let me tell you something. You, you old banks came in there in the 30s and took all those farms away from those people. And they're heading down the road in an old truck and won't hardly run. And they've got six kids hanging off the side and a few pots and pans. And they're headed to California to pick fruit. They came out there and told you to get off your farm that you'd worked for 15 years. Kind of tough. Here's what I say. If they had been lazy, no count, and they was buying stuff they didn't need, and they went broke, that's, yeah, take the farm away from them. But they've been out there working, but they couldn't help it because it didn't rain. They couldn't help it. I'll just tell you a little story right now, and I've told you before, and I'm going to let you go. 1985, in June the 5th, I fell. Karen was carrying Benjamin. I had $600 a month payment on my farm. And I mean, everything in my world flipped upside down and out. And I was absolutely so broke, I could not make my payment on my farm where I live out there right now. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you an example of this. And I, it, I could not make that payment, nor could I see that I could make it a year from then. And I called my lender. His name is Gary. And I said, Gary, this is Reg Kelly. And I said, I can't make my payment this month. And I said, everything's went south on me. Can't make it. And I said, I don't want you to have to call me. The check ain't coming. I ain't got it. I don't know how I can get it. He said, Reggie, could you come in and see me? I said, yeah, I can come over. And about two or three, four days later, I went over to his office, sat down, and he looked at me and he said, Reggie, he said, I don't want you worrying about this. And I'm like, yeah, that's easy for you to say. And he said, we're going to restructure your loan, payment every six months. He said, if you weren't, this is what he told me. He said, if you weren't working, you weren't trying, he said, it'd be a different thing. He said, I've been around a long time. He said, Reggie, three or four years later, he said, things can pass and things can change in your life. He said, I don't want to repossess that farm. I got no interest in repossessing that farm. He said, you're going through a hard time. He said, let's just try to work through it. And I was like, man, I don't, six months come, what am I going to do? He said, you just go to work. You just go back over to that farm. He said, I don't want you worrying about it. He said, we're going to help you work through this. And I'm going to cut the story short. That was in 1985, and this is God is my witness. In 1988, I paid the farm off. That's how fast ch things changed in my life. From being totally broke to where God was able to have some income. Now, get in mind, I didn't pay a lot for that old farm. It was a junk pile, and it was, land was cheap back then, and and you know, don't want to make a sound. But what I'm telling you here tonight is you may be having a tough time financially. I encourage you to look up to the Lord. And just get, it'll drive you to your knees. It'll help you to understand some things. And if, you, and if I'd lost the farm, folks, God might have had another plan for my life. You know, really. He didn't let me lose it. I was able to keep it, pay it off. But I'm just saying this to you. Have hope tonight in your God. He loves you. But take care of your business. Watch what you owe. And don't borrow for junk. <laughs> You say, like, we need groceries. Well, plant a garden, amen. Let's stand. <laughs>